So hello and welcome to Denver Films uh, and Cinema Q's premiere of My Name is Polly Murray. We are so lucky to have the filmmakers with us, um, Betsy West and Julie Cohen. Thank you so much for being here. This film was extraordinary. And one of the things I love about it is that it seems to have come from conversations that you had with Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg as you were doing RBG um, a few years back. And of course, you know that in Denver, we love that film. And now this seems like such an interesting spinoff from that. So could you talk just a little bit about like, well, exactly what was it? I mean, you know, people can sort of have shout outs to people and say, oh, she's really interesting. But, you know, she must have been really interesting for you to then go, okay, we're going to make a film. So could you tell me a little bit about that sort of moment what, or that trajectory? Yeah, Lisa, I mean, when we were um, making RBG, we became aware of Polly Murray and the role that Polly Murray uh, had in uh, RBG's thinking about uh, equality for women. And we kind of, as you said, filed it away. That's interesting. But it was really after the film that we started looking into who Polly was and going, wow, <laughs> this person was amazing. And, you know, why don't we know more about Polly? And then that led us to look into the possibility of doing something about a person who, you know, had died several decades ago. Was there enough material that we could do, uh, do a film? And, you know, luckily for us, even though Polly was not that well known, Polly had a sense of history and a sense of Polly's place in history and had saved this extraordinary archive, which is at the Schlesinger Library at Harvard, and also, you know, carrying around boxes, 141 boxes in the archive. And also toward the end of, of Polly's life, because of becoming an Episcopal priest and other interest in oral history, had done a bunch of, of uh, audio interviews. And when we started discovering, I said, gee, maybe it's possible to, uh, to do this story. Absolutely. Yeah, you always wonder like, how, how are we gonna, we find this interesting, we had some conversations about it and like, but would there really be something to, would it really be conceivable to put together a story on a historical figure who most Americans, first of all, are unfamiliar with, maybe have heard the name or maybe not, um, and also that died 35 years prior and it really, I mean, it's, it's not a coincidence. Polly saved all this material very much with the intention that later scholars, writers, filmmakers would be interested in a story that maybe uh, the, the America, the world wasn't quite ready for in, in Polly's lifetime. You know, like we, we show so many uh, episodes in the film where Polly was years or even decades ahead of the times and even on sort of self-awareness, I think is another example of that. Paulie was like, you know, actually I'm really innovating. I'm coming up with major arcs of intellectual thought that people, if they're not interested right now, are gonna be interested later. So I better save everything. I mean, that, that's, a pretty, uh, that's a pretty prescient uh, person. Even, you know, I think many of us can't really, can, can see outside things clearly, but maybe not ourselves. But Paulie saw both. Yeah, no, she's sort of remarkable for that. And I have to say that there are a couple of different directions to go just in what you're saying there. One of them is that that 140 boxes and it's like from going to a person that, you know, it's like, oh, will there be enough to like, oh my God, there's so much in a certain way. Um, I mean, I guess that, you know, the wealth of that is wonderful. The trove of that is wonderful, but at the yeah. same time that forces you to make a lot of different kinds of decisions. And you make some really interesting ones in terms of how you use her archive, how you let her, I think, I think one of the most beautiful things about this film is that in a lot of ways, she narrates her life so that this person who's gone for like 30 plus years feels very present to the film and very like in this moment, I think that is extraordinary. I wonder when you discovered that as a structure. Yeah, I mean, when Julie and I first talked about doing this film, we're saying maybe it's a shorter doc, you know, <laughs> maybe it's 40 minutes or something, but 
as first we discovered the scope of Polly's life, and then we began to find this material, we realized that we had the opportunity for Polly to, to tell Polly's story uh, and to, to hear that voice. It was like listening to those audio tapes kind of blew us away. Then we had two very serendipitous discoveries. One was that Polly had recorded uh, pretty much half of Polly's autobiography for a friend who was blind wanted the friend to listen oh. to the autobiography. So that was pretty great. There, There's that that would help a lot of the narrative. And then also there was a, 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 a video that had been taken of Polly. It's at the opening of the film you see in with a clerical collar and Roy the dog is giving Polly trouble that. and typing. And, you know, the, when, when, when we discovered that at Schlesinger, it, it was in a different collection and looked at it, we're like, oh my goodness, this really is gonna allow us to let this be Polly's story as much as possible. Obviously we interviewed people who knew Polly and people who had done research on Polly, but we really tried to keep going back to those tapes, to the voice, to the video as much as we possibly could. And we had to leave things out for as a result. You know, there are chapters in Polly's no life. And I guess we just sort of said to ourselves, all right, this is not the definitive Polly Murray. This is really something to get people interested in this person and to send them out there to find out more about right. what Polly did. Right. Um, well, one of the things that you do, and you and you do it fairly early on in the film so that and so there's another thing that you do in terms of structure i'm curious about but uh you really i don't want to say grapple because then it sounds like a problem um but that there's this sort of embrace there's another word uh you know embrace the gender non-conforming story uh in a way that i think is super eye-opening and there's this sort of moment in the culture right now where you know certainly james baldwin's always been present but not necessarily always been present or embraced as a gay black man. And, you know, all of a sudden, Audre Lorde is referenced in almost every darn thing that I read that has sort of progressive. And then we have Polly Murray now in, the, in your film. And I think that that's beautiful and timely and prescient, as Julie was saying. Um, but I also am curious, like, what were the conversations? Because there is a sort of privacy that's yeah. you know i think that yes when people are gone fine but in another way it's not fine you still feel like you have yeah. to honor what that sensibility is or or more um, instead of assuming that i'm going to say what were your conversations around um the, the non-conforming the sort of gender um challenges that she was facing that seemed so so present and um and how did you decide on how you wanted to do it which by the way is off is really elegant and touching we we really appreciate that. Yes, there were lots of conversations on this on this topic, um, and they evolved greatly over time between Betsy and I and the film's producer Talia Bridges McMahon, editor Sinkway Northern, and also our execs that participate. This is something we talked about throughout because it is, as you say, a big challenge. Um, on uh, in in life, Paulie's sexual orientation, um, you know, and a uh, long-term partnership with a, a woman and, uh, you know, a, a life partner was not public. Everyone thought that Rini Barlow and Polly Murray, well, uh, but Polly, Polly and Rini presented themselves as friends. Actually, those who knew them well actually did understand that they were lovers, but never talked about it because that's not what you did back then. Um, and certainly Polly's um, numerous attempts to get hormone therapy and perhaps even have gender affirming surgery and talking to medical prof professionals about this, you know, going back to 1940, um, that wasn't public stuff at the time. So, and it wasn't something right. that Polly Murray's descendants necessarily have been comfortable with all along, but um, as society's views on this have changed pretty dramatically in recent years, um, I, you know, that mm -hmm. impacted us somewhat. And also the fact that, you know, Polly was a smart, strategic, extremely deliberate person. So 
the information that's in the film, the, the letters that Polly's writing to doctors were saved in an archive by Polly for people to see later. So we understood that was part of it also. I mean, certainly uh, you, you might notice are using the word Polly instead of using a, a she or he or they pronoun. Again, right, that was right. part, of, part of a discussion. I mean, people in the film, obviously people who knew Polly in life call Polly she. Um, a number of trans people today prefer to call Polly they um, because they're imagining that's most likely what, what Polly might've have, might have wished. So, there were there were lots of conversations, and they they were um, painful at times. I would say. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, every mm -hmm. film, every documentary is a huge learning experience. You go into it with preconceptions and an idea of what it is, and you discover things. I would say this film was hugely eye opening for both of us in trying to to understand this issue and to deal with it with integrity and in a way that we hope Polly would <laughs> approve of. And, um, you know, we learned, I think. Well, I think it's fascinating because I think that there's a certain generations of feminists, you like, you think you're like really agile and nimble about what the yeah. next thing is going to be. And then you discover that you're pretty stiff. Like I know that I am like sort of, I often say about Polly, I'm going to say she um, and not yeah. they. And I'm just like, why is that? Why do you, think that that's okay or why are you like you know I mean I'm just intrigued by that and I love some of what people have said and I also think that language is so intriguing because we see it play out when she's at Brandeis and those gentlemen yeah. that you the, the two former students at Brandeis are so touching those thank you because I love them I think they are fascinating I think that wow that's such a get in a lot of ways but I love the conversation about what's going on with like the black student union and all these things and then her insisting on uppercase negro and I just feel like I if we really know one way or the other what Polly would really do about pronouns. But I'm yeah. really comfortable with, I mean, in not, in not Chase and Rachel and um, Dolores. Dolores. Oh, yeah. Chandler. Chandler. Yeah, Dolores Chandler. Yeah. Dolores Chandler. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I knew it's like Chandler someplace in there. Um, <laughs> yes. They're amazing and they really yeah. bring this. They bring this forward and they make, and they're kind of humbling in the sense that you really do have to wrestle with what, what Polly, what Polly means for all of us in a way. And like yeah. where those overlaps are and the power of that. I think that's really interesting. And because of those three people that I just mentioned, I'm also curious, like how do you decide on who you wanted to interview? And I assume that there are probably a lot of interviews that didn't make it on screen because there's just, you know, there's only so much time, but I really love that this group of people also shows up to talk about gender nonconforming and this and what that means and what it would have meant had we heard that or I mean you know yeah earlier about her or you know I mean this conversation about Baird Rustin has happened before where it's just like you don't entirely know how central a gay black man was to like the civil rights movement and ditto Polly Murray in terms of like yeah. the things that allow yeah. me to talk to you on Zoom in a certain way yeah. Yeah, I mean, we tried to pick interviewees who had a connection to Polly, even if they didn't know Polly. So, for example, Dolores Chandler uh, had worked at the Polly Murray Center and and had written and spoken about Polly in a very moving way. We found a something online of Dolores talking about what the discovery about Polly Murray meant to Dolores and and kind of the anger at that uh, they experience in, in recognizing here was this person who had to hide what was going on who you know and and really identifying with um, with Polly so we I think that's what guided us in terms of of finding people. Um, Chase Strangio, obviously, as a lawyer, was able to really talk to us about Polly's impact legally 
ongoing, even though, you know, Polly didn't make a direct contribution uh, and, and, and speak out about LGBTQ rights. And yet Polly's work, it, you can see the straight line. And so, you know, that was important for us. And, and I think, you know, Raquel to just understand what a beacon uh, Polly has become for uh, right, many right. people. Um, and thank you for correcting my pronunciation of the name. It's like, um, um, uh, well, well, so subtly. No, I mean, I don't think I didn't feel correct. I'm just like, thank you for, because I'm like, ah. Uh, no. And don't so. feel bad about calling, I think, because yeah, of what you said. Great. Like, I don't think people should feel bad about calling Polly, she, whatever, because as you say, we have no way of knowing what this, you know, very opinionated person would have felt about pronouns. I really, I don't know. So I think it's okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, and I also think that, like I said, I think that there's a sort of generosity to spirit on the whole film and the way that it works that uh, instead of it feeling like one of us owns her experience more than the other, it's like, I don't feel that that's the case. I think one of the, makes, the amazing things about Polly as well is this sort of sense that like, you know, decades before intersectionality became a word, she was writing that. I mean, oh, your interview with Eleanor Holmes Norton really gets at that and it's like kind of amazing way. And I actually think that Eleanor Holmes Norton seems incredibly um, humble and wonderful about the realization of that, right? Because some people don't admit that they were like, right. you know, feisty young people that could not, not hear a damn thing from someone who was an elder. You know? <laughs> Right. Uh, no, we, we, we loved uh, we loved talking to Eleanor Holmes Norton and the interesting uh, experience that, that she had when crossing paths with Polly of like, first of all, being like, well, we're, we're the activists. Like, what do you mean anyone was doing anything decades before us? Like, you know, just the the uh, confidence of youth and not not knowing what's what's happened before, but also just you know, being willing to admit that, yeah, you know what, in the 1960s, not only was I not a feminist, I didn't even like really understand what this, what my classmate was talking about when, when feminism comes up, like, why would, why would one be advocating for women's rights? Like, we just didn't get it yet. Um, so yeah, it's really, I mean, obviously, some of the fun of making this film that we hope in watching it isn't really just learning the specific history of Polly Murray, but in learning other other slices of kind of, I guess I'd say, undertold history uh, as well. Right. Well, the other thing I think that you to do that, that I'm really curious about, and in part it, it goes to how you structured the film, it's, you know, so you do that thing where there, Polly's often at least a decade ahead of an event that we sort of think of as the marking of the sort of sea change in a way. And I think that that's fascinating. And I wonder what you, you know, it makes her look incredibly prescient, which she was, but it also makes me wonder how history works for us. How do we, you know, we, we sometimes get exhausted because we feel like we're returning, but there's a reason why we return because sometimes that return sweeps more story into our understanding of something like human rights, like civil rights, like um, women's rights, like LGBTQ rights, like the intersections of all those. So I'm wondering what you have been learning this time out um, in doing a film that I don't think proceeds only chronologically. There's some real choices that go into yeah. that. So, yeah. but American history is constantly going, oh, how did I not know about this person? Yeah. Why am I knowing about her now kind of thing? And I do think that you've made a number of films and you have an experience now of what that is. What is that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, the search for, um, you know, getting it right, I guess. And, um, you know, we had this the recent spate of films about Tulsa. I mean, I had sort of heard about Tulsa. I knew a little bit. I didn't know the full scope of it that these wonderful documentaries have told us. But similarly, it was a complete revelation to us that there had been so-called race riots, what they called race riots in Detroit in 1943, you know, with, with police basically slaughtering right. African-Americans, you know, because of tensions over jobs. And uh, that was 
totally eye opening to us. And, you know, the lynching, the, the, the history of lynching that was going on, you know, up until the late 50s, which, you know, prompted Polly's crisis of conscience and, and led Polly to go off to Africa for a year or two and to learn about uh, the independence movements. And, you know, so this really, for me personally, it was a recentering of history, a recentering of FDR for crying out loud. I mean, mm. he was making the kind of compromises to the South that he felt he needed to do for whatever reason, but, um, you know, in Polly's, uh, perspective, uh, completely ignoring the plight of Polly's people. And um, we think of him as being so uh, far reaching and yet he or she, she pens that amazing uh, Mr. Roosevelt <laughs> regrets poem and just sends it off to him and Eleanor. I mean, that's pretty extraordinary. So yeah, there were a lot of moments where we rethought our high school US history class. <laughs> you, I have to say one of the things that I love about uh, one of the many things I love about this film is also that um, you know now there'll be a million selfies that people can use but there's a lot of not just like sort of written documentation but all that vagabond imp dude stuff that you have <laughs> it's just like wow that's a lot of like photos and I know that people take photos of but that and and I don't you know I think that when people go into the archives, um, they're just things sometimes that feel just like such a get in a certain way. And I wonder, uh, for me, that's some of it because it's just wild. And right for I, I mean you know that really spoke to um, the trans people that you in interviewed and also um, any gender you know nonconforming person would be just like, wow, that is so wild that story and those images. Um, what are other things in the archive? I mean, speak yeah, to that. Well, but another, other another total area, Lisa, of like, you know, how much of what we love about the film really all owes to Pauli Murray's forethought and being like ahead of the curve on everything. I mean, here it is, early 1930s, Pauli Murray, like a lot of young people, almost all young men, um, is joining is joining in this movement of like riding the rails across the country, you know, not, you know, sneaking on yeah. to, the, to cargo cars where to, to get a lift from, from, from place to place. Like a lot of people are doing that. Not a lot of them were asking whoever their co-vagabonds were like, hey, could you snap a picture of me as I'm climbing up this train? Which probably must have done because there's the picture. Um, and, uh, you know, just thinking that this sense that actually a lot of us have now, but that not many people had going back to the theories of like, oh, I should just be documenting everything that, that I do. I mean, it really makes when you're <laughs> looking through the archival, Pretty much. Sexual, it makes it really fun. Cause like, wow, wow. Like look at these. And, and, and Polly was also a really great photographer, sort of photojournalist type photographer. So there's really nice, um, depression era kind of sepia toned stills of you know like the, the trip they're t you know the trip they're taking when they're kind of hitchhiking and like camping like uh and uh, you know some some of which were taken yeah. by Paul, others of which you know here is this illicit lesbian couple traveling the country and like yep yeah, they got somebody to take some photos of them sometime i mean it's really it's really pretty astounding well, sadly, I think that's all the time we have. And I wanted to say thank you to Betsy West and to Julie Cullen for an amazing film. My name is Polly Murray. And also just for joining us at the C Film Center, the home of Denver Film and also Cinema Q's Film Festival. And uh, good luck with the film. And thank you all for attending. There's plenty more where this came from. So enjoy. Uh -huh.